So today's session, we are going to talk about how to create a sustainable community. And I thought I might start by asking folks, well, first, let's, uh, let me give you the uh, requisite uh, document so that people can take notes or, uh, or write stuff down or you can just go and you can, I'll, I'll paste that into the chat for everybody. Oh, okay. Um, or if you, you mention a resource, uh, that is a URL, um, maybe drop it in the chat, but also in the document so that folks can take a look. Um, and so I guess first I wanted to ask what people think, um, what sustainability means to them in the context of like a open source project. Does anyone want to say something about the word sustainability and how that, how that means, what, what that means to them? I want to make sure we're on the same page because otherwise we might be talking about more than one type of sustainability, which might not be the type um, that you came for. Um, oh, we've got some good stuff in the chat. Um, doesn't break the stakeholders or community members' uh, brains. Um, having enough contributors, not burning out maintainers, sustainability equals survival. Um, a project where people don't disappear when they're needed. That's a really interesting one. Um, a project that can continue developing software, uh, supportive uh, and supporting. Uh, founders can walk away and it remains. Okay. Uh, and long term. Okay, so we have a lot of stuff about um, burnout uh, and not having it. Uh, we have a lot of things about people feeling uh, supported. And we have a lot of stuff about um, longevity, uh, which is really interesting. And um, yeah, and uh, I would say that some of those things are all kind of coming in with the um, the idea that that more than one person is holding power in the organization. So, um, like Jono, as central as he is to CLS, um, if he left and said, "I'm going to do a, I'm going to finally pursue my lifelong dream of pottery. I'm done with all this open source stuff," probably someone would step up and do CLS. Yeah. I would hope. Okay. Um, it's, uh, you know, they, they might ping him and be like, oh, can you introduce me to that nice Todd guy? But other than that, I think it would happen without him. Yeah. So um, so I think those kinds of things about like separating um, power from like and the identity of the project from a single person into like a group and then how we do that. Um, and so we, we sort of like frame this conversation. So it's like how to create a sustainable community. Um, you don't always get the chance to do a community right from square one, but if you do, you can put in a lot of great stuff at the beginning. Um, so I don't know if people want to talk about like some of the ways that they have found um, for sharing power within their organizations so that you don't end up with like the, the one person show, which yeah. kind of used to be one of those things that we did a lot more of at the beginning of free and open source software and have now found it uh, doesn't really make everybody super happy later on. Um, yeah. Especially even the best of us come with some baggage. Yeah. So. Actually on that note, Deb, I, yeah. would, I, I would love to get a sense of where everybody here has experienced that because I think you're right. Like leadership, Solid open source leadership is critical, but also doing it in a way that, that, that I mean, I know we've got another session later today on, on facilitating leaders, but uh, mm -hmm. what has been that experience that people have got here? And in, in the impact of leadership on sustainability, because we've got a lot of things in here, like sufficient involvement by user community, low barrier to entry, mm -hmm. um, you know, and leaders are kind of critical, right? In helping to create that environment, so. Any thoughts? Any thoughts from our panelists, Lisa, Marie? I yeah, I'm happy to say something on this. Um, you know, it's funny. I think if Jono did leave CLS, um, I do believe it would contain it would continue. But I think you'd have to appoint the next person. What I have found is that those leaders don't always just step up. Now, maybe they would for something like CLS because it's such a great thing. But, you know, I've been involved in other communities like the OpenStack community. I tried to give that away multiple times and we had built, you know, the world's largest OpenStack user group and I didn't want to let it just die. And so I like would reach into the community and hand appoint people, but they wouldn't really stay because it is a lot of work to do. And it wasn't something at that point that 
we were generally getting paid by a corporation to do. We're doing it as a volunteer kind of nights and weekends thing. Um, so instead of finding someone to run that, I just took that community into Kubernetes and containers and kept it going in a different part of the ecosystem. But I think if you don't hand select the next, you know, leader and multiple people because people do drop out, then I don't think it always happens on its own. I love that point, Lisa. And I think that there's a a sort of a, a and in there, like the hand selecting. Um, I was part of a project where we had like one amazing person, we'll call her Jessica, and um, and she was going to leave and move, you know, to another place. And, uh, you know, so for like two or three weeks, the whole project was like, where are we ever going to find another Jessica? And I'm like, she was doing like 80 different things. Yeah. We're not going to find one more Jessica. We're going to find 10 people maybe to do one small piece of what she was doing. And so we, you know, you can't, like if you've been with a project from the beginning for like five years, you can't just find another person waiting in the wings to take on everything at once. You're gonna have to like break it up. Hmm. Good documentation I see in the uh, notes is also really good for handing things off and for ensuring, um, you know, that you, people are allowed to leave without people like pestering them on vacation or when they're yeah. in the middle of having a baby for the GitHub password and stuff like that. This actually kind of raises an interesting point because Shen Ting Ang um, writes in the chat, good documentation as well. So if a contributor leaves, there's still continuity. What would everybody here say is essential to put into that documentation? Like what are the critical because nobody likes writing docs, right? As a general rule, people are busy with other things. Um, what does everybody think? And I'd love to see this in the chat as, as well. Like what, if someone's going to create a document that's like, here's how you continue the leadership, the, the you know, businesses talk about business continu con con continuity planning. Um, what should be in that for a, for a community? I'd love to see any thoughts in the chat or panelists here. Oh, Andy says he's got a, oh, he has to write a, a document for his project. Yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> uh, one of the things that I have found is incredibly crit critical is that the documentation is written in C2 and then given to a third party to make sure it actually makes sense, is understandable, and is relatively easy because the person creating the documentation is usually also the person who understands every single in and out of the project. Um, so it becomes very, very difficult to understand what's that small hurdle that no one would have possibly expected a newcomer to get caught off on. Yeah, I think that's really key and um, encouraging people to do the documentation as they go. Like, so when you, like, one thing you can do is ask a person who's taking on a new project to document what they did and where they got stuck rather than waiting till like five years later, like, oh, can you write up something that brand new people would read? Because you're just not capable of it five years in. Just before Andy dips in, I think Andy, I, th I think you were going to say something, but I'm not sure. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I just want to make sure you can speak if you want to. Um, so my really quick thing I wanted to say was uh, I found a lot of success in um, bringing in new members regularly. If you can bring in new leaders regularly, people don't get entrenched in rules quite so much, but you really mm. got to in my experience, take that on as a, a regular recurring thing or else you're just not gonna get around to doing it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. What I wanted to get on to say, uh, I have to admit I have not taken on a leadership role in an open source community, but I've done a lot of other nonprofit sorts of things. And these are very similar because people don't wanna take on leadership roles. They wanna do their thing and they don't see the need to take a high level view. You have to persuade them. So first you have to know what kind of leadership you need. You might need someone with financial expertise, with legal expertise, you know, uh, fundraising expertise. So you want to right. um, go out and recruit the right people. And then you want to think about leadership succession right away because somebody's going to drop out without much warning because, you know, illness in the family or something. And you want to be prepared to move people up. So I always tell people to think about this on an ongoing basis. 
The nonprofit point's a really good one. And I feel like a lot of, when I see like healthy nonprofits and they have officer roles and things like that, like they'll have a treasurer, but they'll have an assistant treasurer and that person gets CC'd on everything. It might be a little less work at the beginning, but if the, you know, official treasurer had to leave, then the assistant treasurer could step in. Um, And you might have the same for like big committees that are, you know, you would have a chair and a vice chair so that there's always a second so um, uh, Bruce shares a link to ESIP Fed um, about which is taking their documentation seriously. I'll put that link into the into the into the document so we can all share that. But that sounds pretty interesting. Um, also, Heather is saying that OpenStreetMap Foundation is going through a state of flux right now. They want to be more global, but there is a high burnout and different views on the next steps for the future of the project. Some want more structure. Some want organic. Ten years in. Um, people are leaving and now finally some of the board members are helping to shine this light. I think Heather raises a really interesting question there in setting direction, right? Is that a lot of open source projects, especially just tend to naturally kind of wander forth. Um, and, <laughs> and sometimes you can kind of get like a lot of, there's not really a nice way of saying this, but you know, like how people talk about technical debt. I think sometimes some communities can just get a little bit stale um, and they need a bit of a, a refresh or a reboot, but it can sometimes be difficult to do that because, you know, you've been doing it forever the same way. I'd love to get a sense from everybody, like how you've approached that. Like, for example, we had that to a degree in Ubuntu years ago. Um, like the project was just, we were doing the same thing over and over again, but we wanted to kind of spread out into new areas. And that was a little different because, you know, Mark Shuttleworth is kind of the, the uh, spiritual mascot of that project <laughs> in many ways. But um, I'm just curious. I think to it's how- tricky with yeah. a spiritual mascot of a project. It's it like people are like, I think it makes when you have one person, you know, especially with a strong personality at the top, like folks look at themselves and they're like, well, I'm not Mark Shuttleworth. Like, obviously I can't be in charge of stuff. And I think that makes it really, it's, it's like the more able, the more we're able to model that there's room for lots of different kinds of people. And I think one place that can start is making sure that, you know, when someone says like, oh, like, can you send someone over from XYZ project to present instead of like flying the founder of your organization from Australia to like New England, you're like, oh, we actually like Susan lives in Boston. Like you could just like have her take a bus. I mean, you know, in the before times, but um, it's even easier. Like you can uh, like virtually. So like you have to, I think the spiritual mascots have to step out of the way a little bit. Yeah, I agree. I don't know if other folks have experience with that because that sounds like, like when I say that in the abstract, like, oh, XYZ, like spiritual mascot just has to step out of the way. But I think in practice, that's probably been more difficult. I don't know if anyone is willing to share their experiences on uh, either success or stumbling block there. Let me see if there's anything in the chat. Yeah, any thoughts, anyone on this? Um, Elizabeth? Uh, Elizabeth, would you like me to add you in as a panelist or do you want to just chat in the uh, in the chat? Let us know. Happy yeah, let's that. put her on. Well, I can say that I've heard on several projects that someone says, oh, there's no point in me trying to break into the inner circle. The inner circle, they don't know each other. They have their own culture. And often the people in the inner circle are desperate to get people to break in and they might not realize that they're putting up a barrier because just the way they interact with each other. Yeah. I agree. So here's Elizabeth. I was just going to say that I think that those spiritual mascots, um, I think they need to be convinced to not have the answer. You know, I think it's really important. I, I'm, I'm a leader and uh, I've been working very hard to carve off pieces of my job and hand them to other people so that hopefully by the time I step away entirely, the last piece I'm, I'm, I'm handing off will be a piece that one person can take. Um, but part of that is that, you know, when I, um, uh, we agree that Mike is going to take on this one project and people will keep coming back and saying, yeah, but what does Elizabeth think? And it's really important that Elizabeth says, I think you should talk to Mike. 
I think Mike has really good ideas. I think Mike is really in control of this and sort of not, and, and to, to get the, the leadership on board and understand that it's not about marginalizing them or not valuing what they have, but it's about trusting the, the other people in the group and, um, and, and making sure that, that, that you are backing those people up and not undermining them because Ask Elizabeth, she always knows, is not a succession plan. So, yeah. You know, Elizabeth, on that on that note, like I think that's such a valuable point, and I think one element of, uh, I mean, I think we we all know that like being part of being a great leader is um, is enabling and empowering other people to be successful. Um, but I think there is like an emotional connection a lot of people have to their projects. And I think sometimes that can be really difficult to break. Um, and sometimes we don't provide enough guidance, I think, to leaders for how to do that. Because, you know, I mean, yeah, I, I'm not going to deny. I mean, I think Deb used the example of like, I stopped doing CLS. I'd be, I'd absolutely want to hand, not hand over the reins because it's not really that way, but make sure that it can continue. But I'd be very opinionated about how it, how it was run. Um, and that's not necessarily the right approach or the right idea. And that's got to impact the sustainability of communities, right? So um, any thoughts on how to enable leaders to not be okay with not having the answers? <laughs> I have always advocated, and I think this is incredibly important, not just as a leader in a leadership role, but also as someone moving forward in a community, um, make sure that your information diet is shoving new information at you, even when you don't want to consume it. Mm. Um, I, I just wanted to say that um, it's the hardest transition for anyone to make to go from doing to becoming a leader. And when you become a leader, sometimes um, you forget that your job is to groom and develop everybody around you and to, to kind of invest in making leaders around you. And Elizabeth you know, illustrated it really, really well. You have to stop and say, it's not only about me now, it's about the people around me and I need to give them opportunities to contribute and, and become uh, part of the project. So uh, I love this train of thought. Yeah, I would guess in that too and say that um, it means that sometimes if you were running a like a subcommittee meeting, that you might, instead of showing up every time, because like inevitably everyone will look and be like, well, what does Nydia think? And like, you just have to like, I think sometimes you have to say like, oh, I'm not going to those meetings anymore because I put, you know, Mike in charge and um, I won't be there. So like, you can't ask me, you can't look at my face and see if I'm like, ooh, I wouldn't do it like that. You know, it's just not like you have to actually sometimes physically step back. I mean, as much as physical means in this time. I'm just looking through some of the earlier, Dev, when you asked about what mm -hmm. people think of when they think of sustainability and, and uh, uh, a couple of things that people pointed out, a project where people don't disappear when, when, while they're needed was from Andy, um, sustainability mm -hmm. equals um, survival from Jacinto, having enough contributions, not burning out maintainers doesn't break the stakeholders or community members' brains to run it. And it seems like the common theme through a lot of these is um, a healthy environment for people to contribute and participate. And I wonder whether we should dig into that a little bit and explore how you do that. Because we often hear the, the horror stories of people burning out and you know being overwhelmed. Um, how, do we enable, how do we enable people to be able to contribute to a level of comfort that's right for them? Yeah. Is that something you think we should dig into? I don't want to overtake your session. No, but. no, I would. I think that's a really interesting one. And the burnout is like, it's it's like sort of, there's like, uh, there's a couple things in there. There's like setting an expectation. So like, if you sign up and you're like, cool, I'll come to one meeting a week. And then you turn out to be like, not, you know, fairly responsible. And, and then everyone invites you to all the meetings. And it's like, oh, no, 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 no. Like, <laughs> you know. You have to, I think you want to say like, oh, no, no, no. The goal is not for like us to find the new person that's the least busy and make them do every single thing. 
Um, I think another thing, uh, projects um, with a lot of volunteer time, like they, you know, like we talked about strategic planning. And so I think folks make these big plans and then they're like, well, someone has to do it. And then the person that steps up for that does it in the short term, but they don't feel good about it and they don't stick around. Like, I think organizations that have a lot of volunteers have to be like, you know what, we're not going to have a 14 day circus event. We're going to have like a three hour Zoom or a three hour Jitsi and that's it. Right. Like, you know, as nice of an idea as that is, like, so someone has to be willing to say like, that sounds like an awesome 20 year anniversary thing, but not a two year, like, let's get our 40 people together thing. And so like, yeah. Uh, that's so yeah so i think controlling the scope a little bit and then also like setting expectations for contributors um so that it's there's no like well sure it would be great if someone did that because uh, there's someone every day that has not been that someone before and they're gonna do it and they're gonna regret it yeah i don't know there's a lot of good comments in here um yeah about self-assessment i don't know daniel if you want to speak more about the self-assessment we could put you on the yeah, we can you switch. We, we can we can bring you into the gallery if you want, Daniel. No pressure. In the meantime, can I, this is Lisa again. Can I just yeah. um, say yeah. something before you move off the burnout thing? I think motivating the community and motivating the next leaders to step up is is a huge thing. But it's also um, you know events like CLS are so important for doing things like that, for bringing community people together, for people realizing, you know, you're not in this alone. There are so many other people who are doing this and bouncing ideas off each other. John, you have that talk about the 12 steps of burnout. That was a lifesaver for me because I didn't even realize I, I was at like stage 11 or something ridiculous. And, um, and I was totally unknown to me. And I remember you kind of nudging me in the hallway going, you know, Lisa, you, you should really be in this talk. <laughs> just, just, just be there for me, moral support. And I'm like sitting there going, okay, I'll do that for you, John. But then I'm like sitting there going, oh my gosh. You know, so just doing events like this, um, there's a, a new woman on my team named Amruta who, well, my new team, I just joined Cockroach Labs a couple of weeks ago. Um, I don't think she's ever been to a conference like this. And I really encouraged her, you know, to take the day and to attend as many sessions as you can and meet as many people as you can. And I'm not sure if she's in this talk right now. Amruta, if you're here, I'd encourage you to introduce yourself. But doing things like this really gives people the, it rejuvenates people and it gives you that kind of next six months of oxygen to go back to your community and to put in the energy and the time and the effort. Yeah, I think connection is really important. Uh, does anyone else want to talk about um, burnout? I actually just spent, um, and Jono kind of knows the uh, back end, but for my uh, day job, I just uh, went on vacation. I had to schedule a mental health breakdown a month in advance because I was so integral and so important to the brand new processes that we put into place regarding virtual events. And I was the only one who could manage the analytics, who was sending out the emails, who was doing all of the stuff. And on one hand, yeah, that's all documented. And on one hand, yeah, I have a great team, but there's only four of us capable of working within that department set. And even if I were to cross train people, it just wouldn't be possible for my workload to be laid onto the other three people. Uh, so it kind of reached a point where it's like, all right, we need to feel okay having a failure and not sending emails for a week because that burnout um, is more important uh, than ensuring that productivity is 120%. I think that's really important. Like the, yeah, like scoping it back and being like, oh, you know, we were going to do this three times a year. And it's like, we have only four people and we can only do it two times a year, whatever it is, you know, like we we're we're not going to we're not going to set expectations for ourselves that are everybody here 50 hours a week with no weeks off. And that's hard because it sounds exciting. It's not like when you're like, what are we going to get done before the end of the year? It sounds really exciting to make a giant list. But um, then when you actually try to do it, it's kind of it's it's not so fun. Uh, so there's but, um, a video about burnout. Is that, oh, you're Atto Atto, aren't you, Jonah? Yeah, I'm Atto Atto. Sounds like a Star <laughs> Wars character. Um, yeah. 
<laughs> so yeah, I, I recorded a video on YouTube um, of what I learned about it because I, I burned out a number of years ago and it was a bit of a revelation. I had no idea about it. And um, so, um, you know, it, it's interesting, Lisa Marie talking about it because uh, I used to do this talk about burnout years ago. And the basic gist is that from stages one to 12, it gets progressively worse. Not everybody hits every step. Um, in this burnout cycle. And I'd ask the audience to just think privately what level they've got to. And it's amazing how many people will come over to me at the end of the session and say, you know, I'm kind of at like a seven or an eight, which is really not a great place to be. Um, and they just, th there wasn't like a language for understanding what they were experiencing, which is why I found when I discovered it, it's so valuable. So it's not exactly the same thing in that video I just shared, but I think if, if any of you are experiencing burnout right now, then it might be useful. Um, well, and I think too, like I, I have also been there on some of the, I don't have a video to share, but um, I do have a personal list for myself for things that I have noted when I've been like, wow, this, this particular experience is really terrible and I never want to be here again. And I wrote down some of the anti-patterns that I saw in the projects and I was like, I am never joining another project that boasts about how we don't sleep. I am never joining another project where they say, uh, you know, we call each other names because it keeps us motivated, you know, and so you might want to make a personal list for yourself of things that you do not want to, that, you know, that let you know it's a project you're not interested in being involved with. And then when you start your own projects, you can say like, hey, we're not going to brag about never sleeping and we're not going to call each other names because that creates an environment that I don't want to be any part of and yeah. I don't want to be creating for other people. I don't know if other folks have like things that they have seen, red flags, um, uh, rules that they learned the hard way for things that they think are anti-patterns that they would like to share. I think just to add to what you said, Deb, um, a little bit of introspection is really helpful to know where you feel you thrive and where you don't thrive and where you're unhappy to your point, you know, the kinds of projects you're unhappy about and, uh, and to avoid that and, and to make sure that you're taking care of yourself uh, at all times, right? Some of the people that I work with are introverts and they say, you know, they try very hard not to commit, overcommit, or be in all of the sessions, be in all of the hallway tracks and, and just burn out, particularly at an event and to, you know, just go back to the room. It's okay to go back and, and kind of relax and refresh and come back. Um, one more point I wanted to make is we are trying to document all of the roles and all of the work content for different roles in uh, my team because we were seeing that some people were burning out and we wanted to make sure that we cross-trained everybody and anyone could jump in, right? And avoid the bus factor. And the same holds true for projects as well. Yeah. I see a couple of folks talking about uh, setting quiet hours for themselves and um, yeah. Um, Oh, and another red flag, like, um, uh, as a scrum master, uh, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that. It went past just now, but um, Israel, if you wanted to elaborate on the solving problems, like, for people. So is that, like, where uh, folks are giving you their problems to solve? Yeah, and Israel, if you want me to add you as a panelist, let me know. I'm happy to add you if you want to speak. Um, mm -hmm. with your mic or whatever. You don't have to put video on. No one has to put video on, by the way, whatever you feel yeah. most comfortable. Okay, Israel, yeah. I'm gonna add you right now and it's gonna restart Zoom and you'll be back in, in just, a, just a sec, one second. Yeah. I saw also diversity and, and Nitya was talking about different uh, roles and different team members. And I think, you know, one of the, one of the th it's like, they're all a little bit related. Like sometimes, um, if you ask everybody to do everything, like if you ask a coder to take like a half a day out to like design a logo, like one, you're probably not, unless you're real lucky, you're not going to get an amazing logo, but you're also not going to have someone who feels like they have any sense of control over their time. Yeah. Um, but there's, a, it's, it's a, 
like letting people do the things that they wanted to do and are good at. But you need teams with like a number of different skill sets. Yeah. Uh, right. I see. Do you wanna? Do you wanna unmute? Me? There we go. You can hear me now. Yeah. Uh, so as a scrum master, part of my job description is to help my team identify and remove impediments. And part of any um, uh, agile transformation for a team is the process of getting everything wrong about agile. And that's one of the places where that, that is, is a huge opportunity for te a team to believe that this person who's coming into their team, that the, you know, they know what a product owner is, they know what a manager is, they know what a developer is, they know what a tester is, but they don't know what a scrum master is. And here's this, oh, they're going to remove impediments. But that's not what a scrum master is supposed to do. The scrum master is supposed to help the team un uncover the impediments and then help them learn how to overcome them. Um, but if you're not careful, and I found myself in, in this situation, um, you can immediately become the team secretary. And if that becomes the understanding, if that becomes the baseline that the team and management expects, then your performance reviews and the way the team sees you will from that point on be shaded by whether or not you're willing to go in and you know, fill in all the paperwork and make all the phone calls and schedule all the meetings and basically become the secretary. Uh, and that's that's really not what the, the whole hope is. The hope is that, you know, through good facilitation and coaching uh, and mentorship and training, the team will be able to, and, and, and I heard you talk about it a little bit earlier, you know, plan your backup, know who your replacement is, have somebody with the, the same skill set. And, and we talk about T-shaped people, right? You know, we want generalists that specialize in something. Um, but the team itself has a responsibility. They have a commitment to make. They have uh, a role to play in solving those kinds of problems. And even if the best scrum master in the world uh, is willing to take on some of that uh, busy work, quote unquote busy work, um, it's not helping the team unless the team can eventually learn to solve that stuff on their own. And so I think that's a, it's a, it's a huge hurdle but it's also um, one of the beautiful things about, you know, really having an agile mindset and, and, and get, uh, understanding how to implement some of these principles and, and values. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. There was, uh, I don't mean to kind of move us forward, but there was this awesome question that kind of got lost in the chat a little bit ago, um, kind of discussing uh, recognizing others in the community. What tactics, what strategies do you use? And I think that this is a beautiful question, um, especially when it comes to the burnout discussion and moving people forward. Um, so I am also going to go ahead and copy it into the metrics discussion, but I thought it would be worth bringing up here. Yeah, that's fantastic. I don't know if folks want to share strategies they have for making sure that everyone feels included and valued and, um, you know, like they're recognized and important. I, I've got something I, I'd like to share here, which is, and I just, I, I do this a lot when I'm working with, um, with my clients and we're starting new communities. Mm -hmm. uh, I call it <clears throat> um, submarine incentives. So what you do is you figure out what is like um, what is the behavior that you want to see uh, in your community, and then you figure out okay what is what is the first element of that behavior that someone can demonstrate. So, for example, in open source, it could be that they submit a pull request, or it could be that someone organizes or facilitates a Zoom session or creates their first piece of documentation, and ideally that you ideally that you set some kind of tripwire in your tooling to detect when that happens. And then what happens is when they step onto that tripwire and they do that first thing and they accomplish it, especially is that you literally reach out to them with a personal message and just say, that was incredible. 
So to give you an example, something I do all the time, I'm a big fan of Discourse, which is a forum platform that many of you will know. And there's trust levels built into Discourse. And when you sign up for Discourse, you're at trust level zero. Nobody knows who you are. It's like someone knocking on your door at 11 o'clock at night. You don't know whether they're an ax murderer or whether they're your neighbor. Um, so you don't trust them. And then what happens is they go into trust level one once they've read a little bit, and they've participated, and then they go to trust level two and so on and so forth. And I like when people get into trust level two, which is a pretty reasonable level of participation, is that you then just post a, a topic to the forum and just say, I just want to highlight blah for their amazing participation now community and, and doing great work. And what it does is it gives them the social standing, gives them social kudos because you're recognizing them, makes them feel good. And it's completely unexpected because you're not saying to them, it's not like Stack Overflow where, you know, if you have your question favorited by 50 people, then you get a badge. It's just a random act of kindness. But I think as a community manager, the, the computer detects it for you, but the, 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 the recognition, the validation is delivered personally. And I just find it doesn't cost anything. And I just think it, people love that because they love, I remember when I joined, started with open source and I started joining some communities and just when someone who I respected talked to me, I felt good, let alone them saying, you know, great job, or whatever. So. Mm -hmm. I think the public aspect of that is also particularly key. Like, it's nice to say thank you privately, um, but yeah. it's, it's nice to say it publicly and in a way that doesn't feel automatic, like, thanks for doing the thing, you know, it, like, but sounds really specific, like, yeah. thank you for taking care of that, or thank you for stepping up and doing this thing. Um, you know, you did an amazing job. And it's like, so public and specific, not automated, I think is yeah. the key there. I to, so, it's funny you should say that, Deb, because uh, I remember working with one company, and they I recommended this to them and they did it, but they did it in a very cut and pasty kind of way. And to <laughs> your point, Deb, it came across as just inauthentic. And it's yeah. like, well, you got to say something about the individual. Like, why do you appreciate their work? Because that makes all the difference. Yeah, and yeah. You know, also I'd encourage everyone to remember yeah. to recognize um, those things that you can't measure, you can't automate and measure. And someone made a point earlier in the chat about recognizing the non-coding, the non, um, maybe non-technical, however you wanna say it. There's so many people who contribute to communities that aren't gonna show up in the, um, you know, the forum, the, the discourse, whatever the, the tool is that you just mentioned, because it's harder to track. So make sure to recognize those folks too. Yeah, totally. As yeah. a non-coding member, I agree. <laughs> totally. Me too. That I did do a whole video about, actually. But um, super important. And speaking oh. of which, because you know, one of the great benefits of being online here, of course, is that we can easily share links to resources, to books, to videos. So um, you know, I'd love if, as we go through the day, that you can pop them into the document for each of these different sessions. But um, if you want to pop them into the chat as well. That's all good. So, you know, because sometimes I, I've been to CLS and people will recommend books and I'll go home and buy all these books. And it's like, wow, I've ne <laughs> never heard of these books. It's amazing. So share, you know, pop them in if, you, if you've got something you want to recommend. So I think we've got about five minutes left. Yeah. Um, whoa, and then someone dropped in. Emotional labor is still labor. And that's Absolutely true. Andy, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that. And then while everyone else thinks about like some of the key insights that we want to put into the document to share at the end of the day. Uh, sure. Um, don't really have a whole lot to say. I rather like it as a bon mot. Just um, it goes back to recognizing a lot of what we've been talking about, where even if somebody's doing something and they're so reliable and they've always been doing it, it might have once been a passion, but now it might be a chore. And to make people feel seen and recognized um, goes a really long way to making making things like emotional labor, community building, a lot of the glue um, become more sustainable in my, my experience. That's great. Um, all right, so for key insights that we might share in the wrap up, uh, I don't know if folks wanna pull out some of the kind of, like maybe, especially if there's something you heard today that you were like, oh, I never thought of that, that would be, an excellent thing. Um, and then uh, we'll have all the resources in the document for folks that want to dig deeper. Oh, Andy, I guess you're stuck on Spotlight. I don't know how, where's Addo Addo? 
<laughs> Sorry. Really? That's are, people, a are people not seeing the gallery view right now? I don't. Um... I can see it. I believe, it might they, just be yours. I believe it has a default view and then users can actually switch it on their own. If that mm. did happen inadvertently, uh, hover your mouse over the top right hand corner and you should see a box to go full screen. And then just to the left of it, either speaker view or gallery view. That'll allow you to switch. I yeah. don't think we have that level of power. We just see the gallery view right now. Like I can't switch the, the view. Uh, like maybe it's because you're a panelist. Um, yeah, I don't have the gallery either. It looks like our- Yeah, uh, I can see both of them. Yeah, I can I see speaker view and gallery view. Gallery. Wow. I'm, I'm well, currently a panelist though. Yeah, as, as an attendee, we can't see it. Hmm. I, so, um, but I can see the gallery view right now and the chat. Uh, I see, I see. It looks like our viewers are uh, seeing the gallery, which is good. This is what okay. I meant earlier on folks when I said we're building the car while we're driving it. We're figuring out how all this <laughs> works. <laughs> The I added a uh, resource into the chat um, for Team Transformation Canvas and a link. Mm -hmm. um, if anybody has um, awareness of the core protocols that were developed by Jim McCarthy and Melissa McCarthy, um, and, and their book, Software for Your Head, is based on this concept. It's an early take on um, uh, the work that Google did on on team emotional intelligence and basically the idea is there are certain behaviors that every high performing team demonstrates uh, and this canvas actually you can do it together as a group or you can do it individually it takes you through um, not necessarily the practices of the protocols themselves but the but the foundations of them you know are, are you safe do you feel comfortable do you have an aspiration um, are you you know, how do you feel today? That that kind of information, um, I'm still struggling to uh, help my team start down that pathway of building EI and, and psychological safety. Um, but I think if you start early, uh, or you, you make that a, a regular part of the team conversation, uh, and this is a tool that, that I think would help, uh, I, I think that would go a long way to helping uh, the team, uh, especially feel comfortable with new work and, and challenges. Right. Um, just see the there's lots of great note taking going on. So thank you to all of you. Um, thank you to the uh, hang on the we have an anonymous badger, anonymous crow, anonymous coyote, anonymous, mm -hmm. crow, and of course the anonymous bat capoeira. <laughs> okay, lots of anonymous animals taking amazing notes. So what an imaginary, yeah. Um, any final thoughts before we wrap up? Um, I, so I got a couple of things on the take. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, the menagerie. Um, so we all had tools. I think what we ended up with for our takeaways is that leaders need to stay in the background and promote others. Um, build orgs that aren't automatically headed for burnout and start by checking that you personally are not headed for burnout and plan by for succession by keeping good docs and um, uh, having, I guess, redundancy or seconds. Yeah. Right. And so, uh, so that's what we have for takeaways. Anything else that someone was like, oh, I thought you were certainly going to say next, we could put that in. Nope. And I also just say thank you so much for the incredible engagement on this Google Talk. It is absolutely wonderful. Yeah, this is awesome. Oh, yeah. Actually, thanks for uh, modeling the other thing, which was to like uh, thank people publicly and specifically for their contributions. Yeah. We have the greatest documentation zoo I've ever seen on Google. <laughs> <laughs> Um, just a quick reminder for everybody. So there's going to be a main session um, within ATO next in 15 minutes. And we're going to resume back at 2 p.m. Pacific for our next uh, session, which are going to be uh, building diverse teams and projects with Guy Martin and then measuring community health with Samantha. So that's going to be kicking off at 2 p.m. Eastern. Eastern. Uh, yeah, not Pacific. Not Pacific. I was like, whoa, that's like a yeah. four hour lunch. 
Yeah, I'm doing so much time zone math today. Um, so yeah, so you can go and you can go and check out those sessions. Um, I'm going to be leaving this this Zoom session, it, which is track one, just going for the entire day. So the next time you join, it won't ask you to wait to join. And Amber's going to do the same thing. And again, just throughout the day, if you ever want to speak, if you want to join as a panelist, everybody's more than welcome. So um, it, I think it makes the discussions even better. So yeah, thanks everyone for your participation.